and also in the keynotes. One was you will hear topics that are more or less close to your current reality at this conference and some of the topics are far away. And I guess I'm in the second category, but nevertheless, bear with me. Um, there was also a statement um, that blockchain is not fit for purpose. I would argue it depends what the purpose is. And I hope to show you that there is a more fundamental purpose than just doing something like Bitcoin. And it actually connects to what Moritz was just talking about in the area of sustainable development. My hypothesis or my claim is that blockchain can solve a problem we have no other solution for. But the thing is also true, we only just started doing this. We are at the first step of a very long staircase. And that problem is how to trust each other that we all do what is needed together to solve a certain problem. Um, I hope it's okay, I took a picture of one of the workshops yesterday uh, by Textile Exchange where the audience was asked to rate the risks of certain um, topics, as you can see, sustainable reduced fibers and materials, climate change, waste, etc. So we seem to agree what the problems are, but we have not really a good idea how to solve them together. The UN has a lot of processes and, and conferences, Paris Agreement and all these things, but we know that it's really difficult as a group of peers, nation states, individuals, to actually achieve something together of, of such a profound um, change. Let's start from the beginning, um, because I hope it's not too much of a tour de force for the next 30 minutes. I, there will be a few slides where there are no pictures and a lot of words compared to other slides. Bear with me, no angst, no, don't fear. We go there together. So where are your customers today? Well, most of them are busy doing other stuff online. Somewhere, you've, I'm sure you've seen similar pictures, what happens in an internet minute, where people spend the time, how much video is uploaded, etc., etc. People are really busy with that stuff. And most, the large part of it is consuming whether it be Netflix or YouTube or simply uh, sharing photos, etc., etc. So that's the majority of the people and that's what you see if you do market research and, and look into your customer base. But then there's a small group of people, a really comparably tiny group of people, that spend their time differently. They're up to something else. Let's call them for the moment the hackers and the makers. And there is a, a nice chart that, that shows a few of the values and a few of the, the goals they try to achieve. They meet together to learn about technology, to explore, to tinker with, and to push the boundaries of what's possible in software, in hardware, and in other areas. Why I'm telling you this, you could say that's probably 0.001% of my customer base, if at all. Why is that relevant? Well. It's relevant because these groups of, of a few people have a large leverage effect because they are able to create tools for all of us. Who is you? I mean, I'm not doing the same uh, yesterday, uh, whether you are a digital person and whether you use a certain amount of tools, but I'm very much sure if Wikipedia had, would have been there yesterday, it's one of the things you use regularly during the month. And it's done by such people. And all of us can use it. It's not a business in the traditional sense. Of course, today they have servers and they need money to run the servers and, and all that. But it's very different to, to any other platform I just showed you in the circle in the slide before. You probably have heard of OpenStreetMap. Linux is the software it's running on my laptop, therefore I have to be here with my laptop because it's not the mainstream thing. Um, they do hardware projects, Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, where, where people sit together and, and, and create home appliances, um, sensor networks. They, they do all kinds of stuff. And you never hear about it unless it explodes, like Wikipedia. Unless it hits 
a need of a lot of people. And all of a sudden, it's there because the technology op is open, the designs for the hardware are open, and everybody can just join in. That enabled actually what we now call Web 2.0. All the Googles and Facebooks, and, and you cannot read them, but you can download the larger version of the picture. All of them would not be possible if stuff like Linux and other open source tools would have not been available at that time. Remember yesterday in, in, in the keynote, 16,000 CPUs needed for an AI to detect a cat in photos? And then what about dogs? You have to do the whole thing again. Now imagine you would have to pay for all that software in addition. And after all, it's, it's Google, which is a company with a lot of resources. So just as a side note, I'm not so sure if we have general AI in a few years. It's really hard and it's really expensive. Back to this. So we have the Web 1 communication, which is kind of old. We have the Web 2, which is what you see here. There's a lot of interaction going on, and it's actually called the collaborative economy or the sharing economy. Well, the inconvenient truth about this is the sharing economy does not share and the collaborative economy does not collaborate. What's in fact happening is platforms that build ecosystems are extracting huge value from human networks for free. You all are part of at least one, probably several of these networks, and you give your attention, your time, your energy, your data, be it photos, be it personal data, to make these um, platforms run. And the majority of us are the consumers, and we think, okay, that's how it is. It's not good, but what can we do? And there's a small group of people who say we are not accepting this. Another word for these platforms is Death Star platforms. So there was, yesterday, uh, Star Wars was avoided. Today I bring one slide with Star Wars references. This is the one. Um, people also use different terms, Uberization, you, you, you have heard these discussions. Um, because these platforms, because of the nature of data and software, interoperability, network effects, etc., etc., they turn, they tend to monopolize over time, or actually quite quickly. And that's exactly what's happening. Um, so Uber knows a lot about you. Where are you going? When are you going? If combined with other data, they, they can derive a lot of insight about the behavior of their customers. Now, you could say that's great that Netflix, like was mentioned yesterday, that Netflix is able to basically design series we like to see because they analyze our viewing habits. You could also say it's kind of unoriginal and kind of manipulative, maybe if you only see what you have been seen in the past, but that's how it works. Because the paradigm, of course, there are corporations, they want to make profit and they have their business models, and that's how they work. So seriously, what's at stake? At stake is on, on a personal level that payments and their processing are centralized. What you do on the, on the web is centralized. Not only payments, but payments is, is, a, is a crucial part of the whole thing. That means somebody else is controlling your payment and payment data, because payment is data today. It's not something mysterious. It's simply bits and bytes being sent. And these centralized entities are single points of failure, because people make mistakes or simply do not know uh, how to do it, because it's complex. Snowden and other data leaks. Cambridge Analytica, you have heard about this case with Facebook. And once a year, one of the credit card companies has to admit they lost some data in the millions about the, uh, the customers. But the same problem we have one level up on a, on a national or, or country level, let's say, all money and its availability is centralized. Now you'd say, why is that a problem? It used to be like this. Yes, it's true, it used to be like this. But today we have the possibility techn from technology to organize ourselves differently, and people are trying out these new approaches. We are getting to that. So that means um, 
money centralized, so somebody else controls your money access. It's not the case that you control, of course, you work and you earn your income every month, but go to, a, to one of the, the, the increasing numbers of countries in Europe and, and elsewhere who are in financial debt, and it's not so clear whether you get your money in the bank at all times, because you don't control it. I'm not talking about bank bailouts and how much money was invested, spent there, um, and we haven't decided as, as, a, as a community about this, right? So, the first takeaway. Open technologies enable the masses to create community tools and platforms, like really inclusive community tools. But they also enable the sharing, so-called sharing economy. However, being non-commercial and based purely on volunteer work, uh, all these community platforms struggle to maintain and, and, and sustain themselves. There are big ones like Wikipedia, and, and they collect millions of dollars every year in, in donations to be able to operate. And so that's the current state until, or was the, 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 the state, until out of nowhere, basically, somebody proposed a new solution. And let me show this again, because if you, if you would have a larger version of the picture, uh, you would see this area on the money, which I marked, it says cryptocurrencies, and there is Bitcoin and a few others mentioned. And I would strongly argue that this does not fit in this picture, because cryptocurrencies and everything related to this blockchain thing is not Web 2.0. It's much more powerful. People started to use the term Web3 for this. Um, the decentralized web, the web, uh, the internet of value, and other words. And what it enables is decentralized transactions. In other words, people can transact value on their own unownable networks. That sounds a bit strange. That means, um, remember the Death Star platforms or the central entities? In this new world, there is no central entity. In the case of Bitcoin, everybody says you don't need a bank. That's true. In other application areas of blockchain, you also do not need this entity. You can think of, of Uber without the company or Airbnb without the company and still be able to do everything you do um, um, on, on such a platform. So now there's a slide with a lot of text, bear with me. The promise of the decentralized web is, as I just said, people can create their own transaction networks. And these new networks offer uncorruptible transactions. And that's, well, kind of revolutionary because it enables people to actually transfer real value as a token or as a software code. You may have heard cryptocurrency and smart contracts. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to explain this in depth, but you're cordially invited to join me afterwards in the workshop where you can, if, if you're interested, you can talk a little bit more about how that all works. And I've also brought other examples that I'll probably tell a bit at the end of the talk. To make it, it the, the briefest, possible way is uh, there's a clever combination of cryptography, like computer science stuff, and economics. And this is combined in a way that um, once set in motion, no single entity can interfere with it anymore. That's exactly the bank in the middle, or the state, or this platform which control, I mean, Facebook controls, obviously, what you can do on Facebook, right? Uh, or LinkedIn can control how you contact people, what you can exchange, whether you can exchange URLs or not, and, and stuff like this. And this combination made people in that community quite confident that such transactions are more trustworthy than anything else you have today on the web. Because anything else today on the web depends on this player in the middle who does it, who offers the platform, 
who connects the people, who transform, transfers money, etc. And of course, in many countries in Europe, we have well-functioning government, governments, uh, we have rules of how companies are supposed to behave in terms of, of data, etc., etc. So usually you can rely that if you go to your bank and you transfer money across Europe, it simply works. And it's not the problem we are going to solve. It's not, that is not the main problem. The problem is in countries where this doesn't exist, or it doesn't work, or it's prevented for whatever reason. Oh, so, yeah. Probably most of you haven't understood what I was just saying. Fear not. We are in an early stage. There is time to learn and time to think about really the consequences. And I, I, and I would invite and, and urge you to actually spend this time. Uh, yesterday the idea was to get younger mentors. Maybe think about this. Get somebody who is able to explain this in your language. It may not be relevant next week but it's definitely relevant over the coming years. And because it's open source software and it's community driven, you have no idea what will come up by Christmas. You simply don't know. And then it can be very fast. So one example for the cryptocurrency, this is one of the websites where these cryptocurrencies are tracked. And everybody goes, wow, Bitcoin's price chart is going up or down, or people lost money or not, and what is money anyway, and, and what's a Bitcoin anyway? It doesn't matter. Don't think about money when you look at this. Think about trust. People trust in a system that is pure software and put millions upon millions of dollars or euros into it because they trust the system that it's not going to mess with their money. So trust can be expressed as money, isn't it interesting? And we have programmable money today, so what can we do with trust systems? The other thing is what are smart contracts? Um, I'm not going into that, except saying, instead of having a transaction that says, I send to you two bitcoins, the same transaction could contain software code that is runnable on my and your computer. And because it's within this blockchain system, it's also not changeable and incorrupt, uncorruptible. That means you can run pieces of software that nobody can stop or change while running. Now you could say, do we want that? And probably in a few areas it's, it's dangerous and we have to be careful and people think about these things. But in other areas it might be at least quite efficient and, 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 and handy. If a farmer has an insurance for their fields that um, in the case of bad weather, um, uh, the crops die, they, they get some uh, recompensation from their insurance. Now in reality, if, if that is the case, the farmer has to go to the insurance and prove there was above 35 degrees Celsius for over 10 days and therefore my crop died and the insurance usual behavior of insurance say, we disagree, it was only nine days and it was 34.5 degrees, and they go forth and back and forth and back. If you realize this in a smart contract, the smart contract could just, every day at 12 o'clock, check the weather, have the, the temperature as an input data, and when, when this condition for the insurance is reached, the contract autonomously sends money to the farmer. That's just one example, but Imagine the, comp the implications for industry. It's about not cheating, not being able to cheat. This is where trust comes from. So thinking beyond this, if you have such a system that, that allows you to build high trust systems, what could you do in terms of identity? Which identities do you really trust today? Reputation. Which user product or brand ratings do you really trust? You all know these famous five stars. I only can trust these five stars if I know where they come from. Who are, are these really customers? Have they been giving their independent opinion? Or has the platform sent them a gadget and say, please, could you, could you rate the gadget and you can keep it for free? Which is practice done today. 
Community, which online communities do you prefer? Humans or chatbots? We talked about chatbots yesterday. And now we're getting closer to, to where, where, where your pain points probably are, loyalty of, of your customer or your people. What can you expect from your online customers under such circumstances? They move away as soon as they smell something fishy. And why would they not? And finally, and that's probably the most interesting thing you can do with these new technologies, you can create new incentive systems by, base, by, by simply creating these coins or these tokens and give it to people. So think about what could you offer to your customers um, to mot motivate what, what kind of behavior you would like to, to, to see in, in the outdoor industry. Who has a platform where many people are and you are sure they stick around for some time? I heard you have this and I looked at it and it's a platform, right? A few people, uh, sorry, a few players put their resources together to create this platform and it feels very consumerist. That's not, I mean, you are in, in, in good company with this. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it, it, it's a different thing to, for example, the other one which is called Wiki Voyage, which is a, another project of the Wikimedia Foundation that also does Wikipedia. And there you have travel destinations. It's Wikipedia for travelers. You can go there and you edit it yourself. If you have visited the place for the first time and there's no entry, you can say, I stayed in this place, I was hiking there and it was great, etc., etc., etc. And it's not even using any of the crypto stuff I'm talking about. It's purely based on volunteers, and I have to check my notes because I, I had some statistics. Um, on the average, more than 300 people edit five times or more per month on Wiki Voyage, and over 60 people over 100 times a month. It's a well-maintained website. So how many editors or content contributors do you have to hire to get a similar level of activity on your platform? Or, how can you get such people to contribute to your place? So blockchain enables people to run their own transaction networks together. Transactions are incorruptible. That's why people trust them a lot more than anything else on the web today. So stretch your mind. With such a high trust system, we can rethink major concepts which are really important for the future of the web. Identity, reputation, community, loyalty, incentive. That's where the disruptive potential of this technology lies. It's not about Bitcoin's price today or next week. Platform cooperatives will most probably replace these platforms. Not next year, maybe not in five years. And Wikipedia took, took, uh, it took Wikipedia also quite some time, but today nobody buys an encyclopedia anymore. You, you just shake your hand, head if somebody suggests something like this. Um, imagine, um, so, so if, some, if people today say it's not fit for purpose, um, think of the very first car. What role does it play today if the very first car was running 10 kilometers per hour or 25 kilometers per hour? It's irrelevant. And that's the same here. Things will change and, and they change quite rapidly. So a few more examples. This is Open Bazaar. Um, Open Bazaar is basically something like, like, like a marketplace, like eBay or something. You can go there and you can buy and sell stuff. Anonymously, you pay with Bitcoin or, or any other of the 1,500 <laughs> cryptocurrencies if they are accepted by, by your counterpart. And you just do this. And there is no platform behind with, with a commission and controlling the transactions and, and not allowing you to do certain things or whatever. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's slow. I wanted to show it live, but I couldn't get it run yesterday evening. Um, but it's there. People use it. People experiment, make suggestions how to improve it. And, and it's moving forward. Akasha um, it has an interesting domain name, akasha.world. If you just search for Akasha, you get all kinds of gurus from India. Um, so akasha.world is a social media platform. Yeah, with, with the functionality you would expect from a social media platform. People share photos, discuss, form groups, um, etc. Again, in an environment where they 
simply trust the technology and the place because they know it's not a single resourceful entity controlling it. So there are a few other examples. Uh, I'm not going into them. Um, have a look. All the ones with an asterisk are actually working. Uh, so it's running code and you can use it. You probably need an IT guy who is interested in this open source space and blockchain, but you can run them. Um, but yes, it's true. We are very early stage. Yes, there are technical problems. Scalability has been mentioned yesterday, energy use of some solutions. I'm happy to discuss these things later in the workshop. We, we, we simply have no time right now. Just to say, um, it's true that the, the way Bitcoin runs today to make sure this network is secure needs a lot of energy. It's true, nobody denies this. But there's also a lot of research and experimentation going on in finding new alternative consensus mechanisms that are very different to this. Again, it's the first car, and it does not really matter how long it survives or how fast it goes. And yes, it will take time, although, um, maybe you remember yesterday, one of the slides in the leadership session, it's exponential technology to time contracts. That means from today over the last year, uh, the, the speed from last year to today was quite much slower than the speed from today for the next 12 months, right? Because people build on stuff which is already there. All the experiments that failed are learned and processed and we continue. So, so the, the, the space, the, the, the speed is rather increasing than decreasing. It's just not visible to you guys because it's 0.001% of the people on the internet. And most people are afraid when they hear blockchain because everybody says it's really complex. It's complex if you try to design and, 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 and do something with it. It's not so complex once you use it. I can also show you how the Bitcoin wallet works. It's not so simple. So talking about incentives, who did go plugging? A few people, great. So why did you go? For your health? For, because it's collecting garbage and doing really something useful? Is it nice because it's a conference and it's the thing to do because everybody does it, it's blogging, it's the latest hype? Would it be different if I would give you, let's call them block coins for it? You would say, what should I do with block coins? Would that change if I tell you the city of Malmö accepts block, block coins um, to reduce your garbage collection fee maybe? So the point is not about issuing coins just for issuing coins. That's not different to, to, to vouchers or, or some badges. The art is to create closed loops, circular economies in a, in a slightly different way, to make people do stuff differently. At the moment, it's volunteers. It's because it's cool, it's healthy, it's a combination of a few of the values we share, but 30, 40 people of 200 attendants, and what about uh, the millions of people living in Malmö and Sweden. Guess what? It's done already. Empower is an organization, I think from Norway, I'm not sure. They collect plastic at the shores of the oceans and they give people coins. Have a look. Terra Zero is a scalable framework built on the Ethereum network that provides automatic resilient system for existing environments, a lot of change a DAO somewhere, forget it. That means the forest owns itself and uses tokens and smart contracts to get humans to do good stuff to him. What? So the, fo the, the forest is represented in a smart contract. And if you go to the forest and do reforestation, cleaning it up, Whatever is needed, the forest pays you tokens, if you can prove what you did. No humans involved. That's an art project, but it works. The basic concept works. Isn't it interesting? What else could we so-called tokenize and, and give value to as a resource, which we do not today? More examples, um, cleaning up the the Niger Delta region dot network is doing something similar to, to the farmers I mentioned. So um, farmers do CO2 capture by what they do on the field. And they want to motivate them to do more of this by giving them tokens. 
And again, it's about closed loops. So it's here to stay because it's like the internet, it's unstoppable. You cannot switch off the internet, you cannot switch off a blockchain. It's running until the last person with the last computer will switch it off, and that takes time. The incentives are in favor of sticking around, my time is up, uh, because it's open source code, because in addition to that we have incentives in terms of cryptocurrencies for people to, to further develop it, and it's decentralized. There are a lot of disincentives to switching it off. Then decentralized web will stay because of this incentive structure. The scaling energy problem will be solved, I would say three to five years, that's what many people tell me, and expect many more economic and social experiments in that space, from digital platform cooperatives to new and more democratic ways to govern our societies, which I haven't even touched. I'd like to conclude with a video of two minutes about the research project we are doing at ETH Zurich, combining these thoughts with sustainability goals, a topic uh, which also was discussed quite quite a bit here at the conference. So please, can we have the video? The digital transformation is exciting. It also has potential downsides, such as increased unemployment and the threat to democracy and individual freedom posed by the abuse of personal data and artificial intelligence. Our economies still largely run on natural resources, but climate change and resource shortages lead to political instability and even military conflict, while increasing migration places demands on societies. To tackle the unprecedented global challenges that humankind is facing, we need to collaborate using smart tools and leveraging the power of diverse ideas. The aim of Future ICT 2.0 is to put our social, political, and economic systems on a more sustainable footing. We bring together a broad group of scientists, tech startups, civil society institutions, and individuals. Young and emerging scientists conduct research, which combines cutting-edge information and communications technology with social science. They design and build interactive systems that adapt in real time to real world events. Our node in Latvia, for example, is running simulations in order to adapt bicycle route networks to local needs. Our Italian node is conducting large scale simulations to understand the formation of social norms that help prevent climate disasters. And our Swiss node is experimenting with a new multi-dimensional financial system our current system is good at pricing goods and services, but bad at valuing social goods, such as an unpolluted environment or a stable democracy. By harnessing the power of the Internet of Things and blockchain technology, we can reach the planet's sustainability goals much faster. Complex global problems are not insurmountable, but we have to act now. Future ICT 2.0 will provide a new sustainability toolbox. Last slide. Um, that's an invitation to innovate together, to experiment, to try things out. The last, uh, in, in um, it's still 2018, so in spring 2018 we had the first, and uh, from, from the start, the largest academic blockchain School plus hackathon, so it's also a new, a new didactic concept we're trying out. It's one week, 200 students. They learn about all these technology aspects and how to program smart contracts. And in the second half of the week, they form groups and tackle sustainability issues using this technology and their expertise. We are looking for partners who are interested in joining us and yeah, getting more to innovate. Thanks a lot.